this year. Okay, good evening, everybody. This is the uh, 6 p.m. Wednesday, February 19th, 2020 workshop. And this is our uh, annual report. And we item number two will be those present. So if we want to quickly go around, or Tom, do you want to just record those present for simplicity? I have. I have. Okay, so we'll do that to save some time. And item number three is their presentation of the annual audit. Do you want me to start uh, or any sort of introduction? So I'd like to introduce yes. Christian Smith. He works for, can you pronounce it for me? Whipfley. Whipfley, <laughs> formerly Mac Page auditing firm. And uh, he's going to present. All right, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to review the financial statements that have been issued, but the intent for today is to give you more of a high-level overview of uh, the financial reports and uh, certainly answer any questions that you that you have. Um, so I like to first start off just by making sure everybody understands the relationship with the audit firm. We are we're independent auditors. We work for the council, for the school board. Uh, you know, we do work with management to perform the audit, um, and you've hired us to express an opinion on the financial statements, which ultimately are the responsibility of management. Uh, so with, with respect to the, um, the, the town's financial statements, uh, the, the town's financial statements are prepared by Ruth and Gina. We do assist with uh, some of the final preparation of it in, in the footnotes. Um, but, um, you know, we have issued a, our opinion on the town's financial statements and the school's financial statements as well, and we've issued what we call an unmodified opinion, which is, a, which is also referred to as a clean opinion, which just basically means that the financial statements are complete, they're accurate, in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. So, um, and as a government, you follow uh, Government Accounting Standards Board. So there's a whole separate set of rules that cover a government versus other types of entities. Um, so uh, this is just the uh, this is the town's opinion. So the town's opi opinion is on page 18, and so I've tried to just kind of cut and paste pieces from the financials for you, so you wouldn't have to flip through the financials. But you know, basically, as I stated, it, it says that the the um, that the financial statements are fairly stated um, in all material respects in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. So that's what you look to achieve. That's the highest level of assurance that we can give. Um, this next list is just a list of the different reports that we issue. Um, so the first bullet is the required communication to the, uh, to the town and school department regarding the audit. The next slide has the, uh, the, the highlights of that. Um, certainly the financial statements, we issue a separate set of financial statements for the town and for the school department. Um, we also perform annually a uh, what's called the single audit. So uh, both the town and the school department receive federal grant money, and there's a whole separate um, set of rules that we have to audit uh, those that grant money in compliance with federal guidelines. Um, typically, uh, it's the it's the HIDA grant that's usually the largest um, amount of federal money that's coming through both the town and the school department. So we did we audited the HIDA, HIDA grant again this year, and there were no no findings all money was appropriately uh, spent in accordance with the grant requirements and um, you know uh, nothing nothing to report there for findings um, we also have to submit to the state of Maine auditor the uh, what they call department audit procedural form which just basically kind of outlines to them how the audit went if there are any issues if there are any fraud uh, that's a clean report to them uh, on the school department side we also have to send a report to the state department the state Department of Education and reconcile the upload of financial information to the financial statements and also certify that it's complete and accurate and that the school department complied with the, the, the laws and regulations over the Maine School Finance Act. And so that's a clean report as well, so no noncompliance there as well. Um, so this is the required communications letter that I just spoke about. I just copied and cut and paste just a, a, a snippet from one of the pages there. So. And the important things to understand is we didn't, you know, we there were no difficulties in dealing with management and performing the audit. Um, there were no uh, uncorrected misstatements as part of the audit that management decided, you know, that weren't recorded. Um, there were actually no misstatements at all. We don't propose any audit adjustments to either the town or the school. So, you know, we are provided a clean set of books and records um, without the need for audit adjustments. And then there were no disagreements with management. Um, and so that really just kind of covers that in a nutshell. It's, um, it's just kind of the boilerplate, um, boilerplate that to communicate the results of the audit. Could I ask a question here? I know this is, this is sort of from the disclaimer uh, cover letter here, this part. Mm -hmm. So there, there was a part here that I just said, I 
you know, was reading through uh, some of the disclaimers. Usually when I see audits, I'm particularly interested in the disclaimer language mm -hmm. that the auditors use. And, and you made a statement in here about internal control matters. You don't express opinions on the effectiveness of the town's internal control. So could it be possible that there could be control issues that we have internally that are not covered by your audit? Um, there, we, to, to, to perform and plan the audit, we do have to obtain an understanding of the significant aspects of internal control for purposes of, of planning and, and essentially determining if the financial statements are accurately stated. So I guess, yeah, that is definitely a disclaimer there, which just basically means that, you know, we didn't do a separate study of internal controls to be able to issue a report on internal controls. That's really all that means. I mean, yeah, there certainly could be areas of internal control that have some weaknesses that we didn't discover because that wasn't the purpose of our audit. Our, That's not typically part of the audit, that, that level. No, it's just a matter of, I mean, every auditor is going to um, get an understanding of controls and test, do some test work of controls, but for the purposes of um, expressing an opinion on the financial statements. Okay. So, Thank you. Uh, let's see. Let's see. If we did, well, if there were issues with internal control, we would ex issue them to you in a, in a management letter. And so we have issued a separate management letter, uh, both for the, for the town and the school department. Um, the, we don't have any findings to report. Sometimes we might have some best practices recommendations. Some, some years there may be something a little more significant that we would report on. But as far as both the town and the school department goes, there were no, uh, no findings and no recommendations surrounding internal control in this past year. As a great shout out to the staff because that in the past there have been for recommendations there are notices so kudos that's great but there's no recommendations whatsoever yeah, yeah. yeah definitely a, a clean audit all around um, so this is really more just meant for your I guess just guidance if you were to kind of want to read through this the, the town's financial statements just to have an idea of what the content is is in there I mean we are we will look at a, a couple of um, pages related to the, the town's report and, uh, and some charts that express some of the numbers in, in, a, in a, well, in, in, graph, in graph form. But um, so th this is the 14th year of the town getting the um, Certificate of Achievements, Certificate of Achievement uh, for Excellence in Financial Reporting, which basically requires that the, the, the town issue a, a, a very comprehensive set of financial statement that includes um, a wealth of information including both financial and non-financial information and statistical trends, uh, statistical information and trends over the last 10 years. So the, these, in, in this, there are some elements that you would see here that you're not going to see in a, in, a, in a city or a town that doesn't participate in the CAFR program. Um, so the first 11 pages is, is the transmittal letter. And so that, that letter is, is kind of a nice read. It, it really kind of talks more about, um, it's less financial in nature, it talks about the local economy, um, you know what the what the unemployment rate is. What are the demographics of the town that we have a high performing school system? Um, you know the new public safety building, um, other areas of, of interest over the past year, whether it's new construction or new investments in the town. Um, and that, you know so again, that's really just more kind of an informational about well what's what's going on in the town for the last year and how do, how do we look um, demographically and, and economically. Um, our auditor's report, I've already showed you that page. That's or the, the, the opinion piece, which is pages 17 and 9 through 19. Uh, the management's discussion and analysis is another required element. That's about another 12 or 13 pages. Um, there's that, that, that has a heavy focus on what's called the um, government-wide financial statement, so a full accrual financial statement. Um, it, there's quite a few graphs and charts there as well in comparison of results to from the current year to the prior year. That, that's a pretty easy read as well if you want to have an idea of, as to the financial health of the, of the town. Um, I think in there, there's, there's also some budgetary information in there. Um, I think it's the, the, the bond rating is noted in there that our bond rating is double A plus, um, and I think that's unchanged from last year and probably from several years. So, um, so then into the, the meat of the financial statement. So there are actually three different bases or levels of accounting. I mean, we're really just going to focus on the budgetary basis because I think that's what you're more used to and that's what most people are focused on. But um, the GASB in its wisdom has decided that governments need to report on a full accrual basis. So you've got a full pages 39 and 40 includes um, you know, the cost of your, your, you know, your, your roads, your buildings, your equipment. Um, it's all depreciated, and, and the, the amount of your debt is all on the books and presented, as well as post 
retirement obligations for health care and um, uh, uh, pension and things of that nature. Um, and so the idea there is to kind of have a full accrual financial statement that's more like a business. Uh, so, so, so put everybody on an even playing field. Uh, the fund financial statements are pages 41 and 42. That's really more mirrors your internal books. It's, it's uh, you know, where you keep separate funds. You've got a general fund. You've got special revenue funds for grant funds. There's certainly a, a fund for the, uh, for the public safety building. Um, and then there's the budgetary basis on page 44. And we'll look at a slide that has some details from that. And that's just the general fund, right? You set an annual, you, you, you vote on, set a budget every year for the, for the general fund. And that is what that presentation is. But then there's also additional money that the town is responsible for. There's a number of fiduciary funds. So we have some, uh, some trust funds. There's some scholarship funds. There's some student activity funds. Those are all presented on the financial statements as well in their own fund. Um, and the footnotes support the, 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 the basic exhibits in, in the financial statements. So there's pages and pages on of, of footnotes. Um, so I did want to make mention of what is new this year. Um, and so it was actually new in the prior year, but um, as a result of this new standard on uh, post-retirement health care, the Maine Education Association Benefits Trust determined that there's, there's, a, there's liabilities out there associated with teachers who retire from the district and are able to still purchase health care as they're retired. And so they hired an actuary to come up with an estimate of what's, you know, what's the estimated cost of the future benefits. And that was about a $5 million number um, that was booked to the government-wide financial statement. It doesn't affect your budgetary basis financial statement. There's no requirement that you fund it or anything like that. Um, but it's, you know, it's really out there for you know, the creditors of the town when they're, when they're looking at you and determining how financially stable you are. They want to know what your post uh, post retirement obligations are, and that's very similar to you know the 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 the, the, the town has a health plan for its retirees as well, and that liability is about three million dollars. So, it's it's really along the same lines as that as that plan. So and there's there's there are disclosures of that in the in the financial statements as well. And, and usually there's questions on that. So, yeah. <laughs> just one quick question. I know one year you had suggested you thought somewhere in the near future that it'd be a funding requirement. Has there been any any more indication that that's going to be coming our way? Um, no, I haven't seen anything where there's going to be any sort of funding mandate requirement. Um, but it's yeah, I guess really ultimately what's the, I mean the idea behind it is that your you know your current costs are probably higher because you've got retirees in the plan instead of the active and younger younger employees. Um, so I think you know your premium you may see your premiums continue to go up over the years as as you have more retirees in the plan. So I'm not sure I completely understand this. So this is the MEA retirement plan. Mm -hmm. In aggregate, they feel they're five million dollars short, or Scarborough's portion. That's Scarborough's portion. Scarborough's portion is five million. Every town has their, or every okay. every well, every school that participates in that plan has has a, a liability. And right now, that's funded by the MEA, or the, uh, there's actually no. It's just it's really just pay as you go. You just pay your premiums on a monthly basis. There's no there are no assets in that plan at all. It's just this is an estimate of what the future cost of retiree health care is, even though. The, the thing that's really kind of um, hard to understand about it is that when teachers retire, they pay 100% of their premium. Mm -hmm. but, but, but the point of this is, is saying, well, they're getting a subsidized rate because they couldn't get that rate if they were on their own. And who's subsidizing them? Well, the, you know, the school department sub subsidizing them in, within their plan. By increased premiums. By and increased the, premiums. And to the, the town is the yeah, same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Increased premiums by virtue of the fact that retirees are included in our experience. They're part of our plan. And so to the extent that and generally those folks are older and maybe require more health care. So comes out in the wash. We see it arguably in premiums by virtue of the fact that they are part of our experience. Okay. Yeah. But I, you know, I, can, I mean, it's, it's definitely common. You'll see this in any uh, one of the communities within Maine. Um, I, you know, I can say overall, Maine is definitely on the lower end in terms of these liabilities. I mean, if you go to New Hampshire, the, the liabilities are enormous. Um, I think they've got, they're, they've got subsidized health care where, the, where they're actually paying for a portion of the, the premium and not having as much come, come, you know, come in from the retirees. So New Hampshire or Connecticut, uh, the liabilities are significantly, significantly larger. Yeah. It does actually make sense to me. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so do we know how many of our employees uh, or retirees continue their, their plan? 
Is it a large portion? Is, it... is that for the town? That's for the town. For the town? Yeah. We, we know it's for the person. HR has, I think. They don't really track it, but periodically the audit and other things, we have to get that information. So they provide us with that listing. The health care does it. We don't even interact with it. All part of the plan. They they can they have the right to continue their plan. Right. Correct. At separation, it's up to the retiree to then take it upon themselves uh, to to get that health insurance. They have to. Um, if somebody leaves, they have to be. There are five requirements. I don't remember what they all are, but if they meet all those requirements, or four or five of them, then they are eligible to continue on with the the health plan. Um, so next year there is a new accounting standard that we have to deal with for lease accounting. I'm not sure that it's going to have a significant impact on the town, um, maybe the school department. Um, I don't know. Do we have a lot of uh, copier leases? Do, do we have, well, copier leases are probably not significant enough. But like I don't, we don't have a lot, a lot of mo uh, modular buildings or um, you know uh, what do you call them? We that we those. don't lease, we right? Own. We don't lease. You own them? Yeah. Okay. We're in the pleasant and then position of buying them out, right? Um, yeah, there is. Yeah. Probably not significant enough. Yeah, probably, from what I've seen, it's probably not a big impact, but it's, uh, you know, it, it, lot, well, there's a lot changing in the accounting world, and they're going to make us book an asset and a liability associated with leases. All leases come on the books as debt now. That's that's the idea behind it. So they're apply, they've applied that to businesses over the last few years. Uh, publicly traded companies have had to apply that, and so now it's coming down the pike for governments, too. So. We do show that under debt service, don't we? It's a, yeah, it would just it's just essentially like that. in a different way. Yeah, well, we sh you're right. We do. We don't show it as asset liability, but we show it in the debt service schedule. I think. Correct yeah. for capital leases, right. right? This is just saying operating leases would also go on the books just like that. So. Just a quick question on, on what is new in future years. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm sure you're where we kind of introduce. You know, we have a C, a pretty large CEA that's out there for future. Is that going to be something that is going to where is that going to be accounted for, the CEA liability as you're doing the books? Is that? Um, I don't believe there's a liability, but there is a separate footnote on that that was put into place a couple, two years ago maybe, yeah. where you have to yeah. disclose and say, okay, here's a, here are the, um, um, uh, well, I guess, yeah, you're calling They call them the tax tip, abatements. Tax abatements. Here's the tax abat value of the tax abatements that we've provided to taxpayers. So there'll be a, a clear disclosure of, you know, how much, and I believe who, who they're provided to as well, if they're, if they're significant. Um, you can find them on page 79 of the town's financials footnote. So it's just a footnote that will not hit balance sheets in any manner? Yeah, I don't believe it hits the balance sheet in any way, shape, or form. It's just, just it's additional It's just the current year items that hit the, yeah. the audit. Was that any, any uh, chart that has figures other than just uh, page 79 and narrative? Do we have a report on that, a listing of total tax I think that's the only, I think that's the only, the only reference. reference to it. I don't think it's in the supplemental either. Yeah, no, I think that's it. Okay. That is an interesting point because for value that's already been added to the district, there probably is a liability there. But for the value that hasn't been added yet, it would be a contingent liability, which I don't think there'd be any place to put it. I don't yeah. know where you'd put it anyways. Mm. Well, I was just thinking it'd be the, the CEA of payment amount would be based on the tax Taxes. values as of April, right? Which would be at the tail end of, because we're a 7 1 year, so the value would be determined in April. So is it a liability at that point in time when he's doing financial statements for? Are you thinking about the? The the current year payment? Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the values. Yeah, no. So the value is determined as of April one for the next year's payout. Yeah. So it's known and it's determinable and presumably probably exists at that point in time. So I was just curious yeah. about how. I, I think three it's three different models on a few right. curl basis. Right. You probably should do something with it on a modified. Right, which you wouldn't be able to build. We can't. We don't. Wouldn't recognize that tax revenue, and it's 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 contingent on the, the the taxpayer paying the paying their tax bill too. So, I think we can't we can't recognize the tax revenue early, and so I don't think we'd, we'd recognize that until it's. I mean, even though it's it's set at that date, I don't think it's. 
Plus, I think even though the yeah, assessment yeah. date is April 1st, the tax commitment, uh, the taxes yeah. aren't committed until August or September, which is in the future tax year. So it, it, we can't really estimate what what that might be. No, I was, I was just curious about the time because that will be, be mm. interesting going forward. Uh, so the next set of slides just has some some graphs that are that are pulled from um, pulled from the financial statements. So your general fund fund balance. Uh, for this is the town. This is the town and the school combined. It includes the school, um, but you can see for the year the uh, the town's fund balance is about fourteen point three million dollars, um, which was an increase over the prior year where it was about thirteen point eight million. So you see the fund balance went down. Uh, in, in 18, there was a very large allocation of, of fund balance to use for the budget for both the city and uh, for both the town and the school. And in this year, it wasn't quite as large. And you'll, you'll see that in a, in a subsequent slide as well. Um, but a total of like 14.3 million for the, for, the, um, for the town's fund balance. Uh, this slide just shows you the unassigned portion of fund balance. So that's, that's the part of fund balance that really hasn't been committed or designated for specific purposes. And you, you look at that for your policy purposes in terms of well you know geez if, if the um you know if our fund balance is at 10 unassigned fund balance is at 10 percent or more and then once it hits 12 we're going to allocate some money to you know maybe tax uh, relief or um, capital expenditures or debt retirement that kind of thing and so you're at almost 10 percent. i think it's 9.81 percent as a percentage of your budget um, and again, your policy is to, to be at least 8.33%. So you're above your policy, but not quite above the threshold for allocating funds elsewhere. And so this just also shows a couple other communities that are, um, that are nearby uh, in terms of where they're at. And this is pretty consistent with what it's been in the last few years in terms of, you know, Falmouth. Um, and Falmouth and South Portland having fairly high um, unassigned fund balances and, and Cape Elizabeth having a, you know, more of a moderate one. I think typically it's... Um, and I didn't put Westbrook in there, but Westbrook's typically around 15 or 18 percent or so, and that's more of a function of their policy than, than anything else, I think. So a, a high percentage is good and a low percentage is not so good? Right. Yeah, in general, I think probably, probably I, I've always been told um, the bond rating agencies like to see at least one month, so but that's 8 percent, but maybe not. I've heard if they have more than two, they don't really like that either. Well, they're getting to two. I think they're pushing towards two now, Are but uh, our policy... Our limit is eight, our lower limit is 8.3, but our policy states 10, and then if we go over the 12, so we're we're just almost at our policies. And how do we pick those those towns again? I know three of the four we border us, Falmouth doesn't. So we just want to pick Falmouth to give it give us a best in class, or what's the what was the reasoning? Here? Um, it was just it was more just based on locality, and I think just more more in terms of similar more similar. Um, uh, you know, I say demographic status. Okay. And you'll ask me the question about the schools, and the schools I use different numbers because it's what I ha what I have access to. Okay. This this the information for towns is more readily available. The schools I only have access to what I have, what I do uh, for work. But I, there I based it on budgets, annual budgets, so it, ones that are similar. So we were having a flashback to last year. Yeah, yeah, I think it was. <laughs> Stage <laughs> <I remember> happening <laughs> over here. <laughs> I, this might be tough to answer on the spot, but do you know the policies for any of those towns that we're being compared to? For instance, Falmouth, do we know what Falmouth's policy is? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I didn't That's look right. it up. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you, yeah, I can tell you Westbrook is, um, I think they're, I, I do Westbrook and I didn't include them on here, but they're, um, they're yeah, their policy is above 15%. Okay. And they're at, usually typically at 18. Now, do you find other communities... Uh, Try to maximize their fund balance, or I, I think for us, we just try to maintain the minimum. Mm. Anything extra, we don't budget to increase fund balance. I guess what I'm saying. Do you right. See other communities doing that? Um, no, I mean I think they're yeah I think they're trying to keep it. I, I think they're trying to keep it steady, but a lot of them do have a similar policy where if they get over a certain amount, they start to mm. uh, carve some money off and send it over to like a reserve fund of some kind to fund future needs for capital needs or whatever so yeah so i mean i think as a whole i mean i guess if you look at it in that respect they um yeah i know there are other other communities are they're, they're, they're definitely trying to build but they're they're putting it away in other other for other purposes yeah i'm not aware of any community that will actually physically or consciously budget to build fund balance mm -hmm. um, it's done through all sorts of you know budget experience positive experience obviously 
uh, both revenues and expenditures. Um, oftentimes, overlay is used as a method to uh, to build that over time. But do recall that these are monies that arguably aren't needed to operate our fares, and so uh, I think. I, anyway, am sensitive to the fact that we shouldn't raise any more than we need. Right. Um, there's some other factors why more is better here, but uh, that's at the expense of the taxpayers. That means we're raising more money than we need to, to operate uh, the run operations. So sensitivity of uh, pressure on tax rate is a big part of this. So this next page is just, it's page 41 of the financial. So it was just really kind of to show you at the bottom part of the left-hand side is where you can see the, the unassigned fund balance comes from. So there, the bottom three rows uh, shows you um, we've got uh, unassigned town fund balance of like $8.2 million there um, in the general fund. But also wanted to point out as well that there are, you know, there are other significant aspects of the town's reporting. So the public safety building is the third column to the, from the left. Um, and this just kind of shows that there's uh, about $10.4 million in fund balance for the public safety building as of June 30th. Of course, at this point in time, it's, it's probably all spent or substantially all spent. So we do, uh, you know, we do procedures on, audit procedures on the significant other aspects of the, uh, of the town, including the, the, the public safety construction in the past year. Quick question on Heights Berkeley. Are we near the end of the as a figure for Heights? Um, the, the number there, one point nine. Okay, as an unassigned. The the one point nine is made up of a couple of numbers. One is the uh, sewer assessments that the the folks are making payments on, um, and the second piece is the TIF revenues that we get and. Hygis kind of went in just at the start of the recession, so there wasn't a lot of building going on. So there wasn't a lot of uh, increased assessed value. That has started to change, so I think over the next few years we might begin to see this deficit uh, decrease. Okay. In, in both respects, as land are, is sold and developed, uh, sewer assessment, those liens are being paid off, so that helps us. And then as value is created, it helps from the, the TIF point of view. So, we borrowed money uh, for uh, infrastructure build-up, road, utilities, and the like. Uh, and rest assured, our uh, folks that own those, purchase those bonds, want to get paid, and we have, in fact, paid them. The revenue has not kept pace with those debt service obligations. So we've been tracking this. Uh, I have no doubt at some point, uh, sooner than later, we will flip that scale and, uh, and the right to shift. So, thank you. Uh, the next couple slides just are, are meant to show just the uh, changes in the significant revenue and expenditure sources for the town. Um, this is all on a budgetary basis, but um, you can see, you know, property taxes, um, you know, they're up about 5% in the past year from $62 million to about $65 million. Um, next slide shows the other three, and this is just based on one of the most significant revenue streams for the town. Um, you see a steady increase there on the green one is uh, excise taxes. That's at about 6.4 million. Um, getting about 2.6 million from state education subsidy. So that actually went up this year after going down to about 2 million. Um, I think just about every school got, a, got an increase there. Um, so that's good news. Um, and the state revenue sharing, that's pretty, pretty flat, about 900,000 or so, 960,000, I think. Um, the next slide shows the major education major expenditures um, so again on the budgetary basis education department expenditures went from about 46.3 million to about 48 million um, so just doing the math in my head I think that's about a 5% increase kind of in line with the, the property tax increase Christian, could, could I just uh, have you go back for, for a moment on excise tax mm -hmm. I'm not sure which exhibit is it exhibit, uh, A2? Uh, A2. this A2 yep page 88 the reason I bring that up, this is an area that continues to perform. Um, and Peter will attest to this every year. We're anxious about what's going to happen the following year, and we end up increasing the budget estimate, and darn it all, we not only meet it, we beat it. And so, it, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that next year is going to be any different. But 
Um, I just want to make a point. We were fairly aggressive, as I recall, by adding as a final measure in the budget process by adding significantly to that estimate. And in fact, uh, we exceeded it uh, handsomely. And I, I just want to be able to quote that number. Can you pull that off this page? Um, let's see the uh, the budget in the How actual much additional excise that we bring in. Then oh, we yeah. So yeah, the budgeted um, budgeted excise taxes was five. Five million eight seventy nine, actual was six million three sixty five. So a positive variance of four hundred eighty six thousand, and that's and that's an increase over the eighteen excise taxes of uh, about four hundred thousand as well. Is that people buying new cars, or is it we're yeah. buying more cars? I mean, we're, well, we as population more grows, down. more cars are being registered, but I think it's more probably the the big line share is people buying new cars, and there's a higher excise tax paid on a newer, more valuable vehicle. And then also we receive um, excise oh. revenues for the big Mack trucks and things, and the state Please. gives us a good share of that too. So mm. that helps. Now, in in terms of accounting, one of the things that we're supposed to do is be very conservative in our estimates of revenues when we put those together. But we're supposed to be as accurate as we possibly can on our expenditures. And I think between those two, that's what helps to build the fund balance as well. Yeah, so that positive variance of 486,000, that's, that's one of the ways that you build fund balance. That's revenue not expected, and so it uh, is booked at the end of the year and becomes fund balance. Becomes fund balance. Do we you know how we're trending for 2020 on excess? Ruth, have you looked at that recently? Um, I did. I think we're, we're on track right now. It's, it's uh, yeah, actually, we'll know better I, when we do the. Yeah. The end of uh, second quarter, I believe, we're ahead of we're more than fifty percent. More than fifty percent. So we're, yeah. we're certainly tracking on budget and slightly ahead. And who knows with the President's Day uh, auto sales uh, this past weekend, <laughs> it could be up big time. <laughs> <laughs> Some other major expenditure trends, pretty steady here, not a lot of increase, but uh, public safety is at about 11 million, public works at seven. Um, the debt service expense on a budgetary basis is 5.6 million. Now this debt, the debt service number is just the town only, the schools is a separate, is separate on top of that and included in the education number that I showed you previously. Um, and so the things that Tom was talking about in terms of like building the fund balance, so the budget to actual summary on page 44 really kind of shows you um, some of this. Uh, there's, there's more detail if you go further back on page 88, it breaks it down by, by actual, by like revenue line. Um, but this really kind of shows you that for the year, uh, you know, total revenues were favorable to budget by about $714,000. Um, expenditures were favorable to budget by $980,000. Um, and so those those things attribute are attributed to increasing the fund balance um, kind of in the towards the bottom of the page under um, other other financing sources uses you'll see a line for utilization of surplus so you budgeted to use about a million four out of fund balance in the current year um, actual results were favorable so bottom line is that our increase in fund balance was five hundred twenty seven thousand 355 so again just a combination of more money came in than we budgeted spent less than we budgeted um, from a number of categories including the school department which was under budget by about 626,000 uh, capital improvements were under by about 416,000 and off offset by some um, uh, over expenditure or, or amounts over budget in some categories general government public services and uh, looks like public works um, but they're offset by increases in other categories could someone explain what overlay is mm -hmm. overlay is, uh, is the amount of money that we put in the budget to meet what we expect will be um, uh, abatements in that following year so monies that we would pay back that have been billed are arguably an error and um, a refund if you will or abatement is due to the taxpayer uh, Revaluers uh, have a tendency of throwing that number out of whack. But on average, a typical overlay payment is in the order of 200000 a year, maybe less. So can we attribute that to any one thing you mentioned, revaluation or any, any other things? That no, I'd say re revaluation is, is the thing that really makes these last two fiscal years really unique, okay. just because you're touching every property and there's more potential for 
error, if you will. Okay. Uh, and, and so not surprisingly, you'll see a, a higher than average uh, abatement process and cost. And then the overlay, too, is in a, a non-reval year, um, errors or corrections or adjustments come through either through the planning department or through the citizen, and, and either they'll uh, abate the taxes or they might supplement if something is missing. So um, the abatements would show here, except they get built into the property tax revenue line as a reduction. Tom, just, a, just for anybody, uh, is, it, is it fair to say it's a slight overestimation of the taxes we need to collect? By state law, we can estimate up to 5%, which would be a humongous number right. that we but would But just to boil it down, yeah. it's a way of slightly overestimating the taxes we need to collect to, to, allow guard, for to guard against our abatement. Correct. In fact, it's, it's, yeah. it's one of, if not the final decision the assessor right. makes before setting the tax rate. Right. It, this is an amount that we need to raise to meet an expectation that will happen over the course of that fiscal year. And Tom, this year, wasn't it, isn't part of that we put some money in there for the Settlement. In this fiscal year, you're correct. We, we set aside purposely. Well, it was a big $300,000. Yeah, three hundred thousand. Right. Yeah, there was uh, the potential for additional liability associated with some ongoing tax matters. Um, that matter has been settled uh, at the state Supreme Court level. Mm -hmm. uh, and so at this point, we don't expect that, that we have any financial liability, but yeah. it could potentially go to the U.S. Supreme Court. We'll see. But, but usually that number is a couple hundred. Yes. On average, I would say uh, historically it's in the $200,000 range. So, so there was a purpose. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, I remember that. Now, when I look at this slide, so you have a, a budgeted amount for overlay, but there's zero for actual. You may have touched on this, but is that because you're never going to see the actual show up in the overlay line? It's going to go in the abatement or other? Generally, line? it shows in the uh, property tax revenue line as, a, as an adjustment to that. It's kind of I consider it like a contra revenue, but uh, the supplementals don't show separately either. They're all just built into that actual number. So the variance isn't necessarily 672, 280. Correct. It's probably something less than that. Correct. It's offset. So, yeah. 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 <clears throat> um, the remainder of the slides relate to the school department. So um, if there's any other questions with respect to the town's financial statements um, but certainly you know I'd say that the town is in you know you know excellent financial shape as you know evidenced by the fund balance amounts and um, you know kind of in line with the, the your, your fund balance policy the bond rating um, things like that so uh, moving on to the school department the school department's report is um, there's a lot less pages to it um, We've uh, so again here's just kind of like an outline of what's in the the, the school report. It's uh, you know pages one and two is our unmodified opinion. Um, we don't issue an MD&A with the school department. Um, it's not it's not a qualification of the the report. It's just a disclosure that we don't do one. Um, it's really not necessary. Um, the school has only two levels of accounting because technically the the town owns all the assets. The town has all the debt in its name, so there isn't a government wide financial statement presented here. Uh, so it's just a fund financial statement, so a little, little easier to get through, a little easier to read, I think. Um, so uh, there's a budgetary basis on page 5. I, I show a slide on this. Uh, pages 6 and 7 are the fiduciary funds, so that's going to be our, we have some scholarship money. We have some, uh, some uh, trust, trust money as well and student activity funds. Um, here's our opinion page 1. Again, it just says that the, the, the financial statements are fairly stated in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. And then I move into some slides. So this shows the trend for fund balance for uh, the school department over the last three years. So you can see a steady decline. Um, 2018 was a really big year in terms of utilization of fund balance. Um, I, I didn't make note of what that number was, but I think it was. It might have been two million or, or more. You know, it was. It was a pretty big number. Um, was the flow through of the Wentworth funded funds that we were? transitioning from one year to the next. Uh, yeah. We basically scrumped it through in one year to get the, the bonded monies out. And, and you'll see as well, the um, so the decrease in fund balance this year was almost $300,000. It's actually favorable in comparison to budget because we were budgeted to use a half a billion out of fund balance. So there's a favorable variance there associated with uh, mostly with just um, expenditures being less than, than budget. 
Um, so this next slide is, is the one that just compares to other schools, and I would definitely say that everybody is running really lean except for uh, uh, the, the big blue one is, is Kenny Bunk RSU 21. Uh, theirs actually has come down a lot the last couple of years. They, they had a big windfall um, when they, um, they exited the uh, main public employee retirement system and got, um, um, I can't remember, how, however many million, several, two or three million dollars um, as a result of some, something to do with exiting the system or maybe it was the lo other local schools, uh, local towns. Um, I, I take it Sanford and Westbrook are zero. Yes, Sanford and Westbrook are at zero. I think actually one of them is actually negative. So, um, so yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So pretty much on the whole, if I if I look across the spectrum of the schools that we work with, um, a lot are under one percent. Um, you know, I think you know. So the town of Scarborough, we're under under half a percent for unassigned or un, yeah unassigned fund balance. The town, the the state will let you carry over three percent. Um, they actually let you carry over more than that, but you try to stick stick under three percent, stay under three percent in, in the carry forward. So uh, the results here aren't uh, really aren't um, unusual. So I think that's an important to note because um, the state, the school, is obligated to do different things with fund balance from the towns. The town can set their own um, their own policies, but the school department is required to have no more than three percent of their budget carry it forward in any given year unless they use it and as Christian said the most most school districts will use it in the ensuing years as offsetting revenue um, in their next year's budget or the year after and I think you have two or three years to to spend it down yes um, but that's why you don't see huge fund balances even even RSU 21 with all their wealth is only at three percent right yes yeah because that's the that's the cap yeah and these, they all have, you know, similarly sized budget. I mean, RSU 21's at a high 40 million, 50 million range, and the other ones uh, that are on here are, um, are at least uh, 40 million or so. So it's all just similar in terms of uh, budget size. Uh, so this next slide just kind of shows you where, well, where did the fund balance number come from? The first column is the general fund. Um, so you can see the total fund balance available is 539,246. Uh, it's the first column all the way to the bottom. Uh, and so for the fiscal year that we're in, the, the June 30, 2020 year end, we're planning to use $350,000 out of fund balance to, to help subsidize that, that budget. So this is showing the major expenditure trends just for the school department. So by and large, the regular instruction is the largest, um, pretty, pretty steady there, about $20 million or so. Um, in this past year, special ed is a steady upward trend as well, 8.2 million, and debt services 5.7 million, and so that's on top of the, 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 the debt service number that you saw for the town as well. Do we know what's driving the special ed number? Um, very simply, a huge increase in need for student services. Um, and the uh, number of children coming in with just extraordinary complex needs. Are we better at identifying them now, or it's, it's just we haven't changed anything, more kids are coming into us? With um, I'm not really qualified to answer that, but I'm guessing that we haven't changed our screening techniques much. Um, we're just seeing more kids with more needs. Um, just as a sidebar, though, it's actually a great thing for Scarborough because that's the only way we get subsidy. Right. We um, as that. minimum receivers, the more we spend on special education, the more we see in the state GPA. So, so yay. <laughs> of course, we then spend it. <laughs> <laughs> so this next slide is just a, it's a, it's a, a picture of the budget to actual results for the year. So page five of the financials and for the key key things to, to notice here is that revenues were under budget by about 227,000, um, most of which had to do with the state subsidy. Even though we got more, it was, it was still less than what we budgeted. Um, but expend, on the expenditure side, held the line in all, in, in all categories, so we spent 626,000 less than budgeted, and for the year resulted in a decrease in fund balance of about 300,000 as compared to planned 500,000, and that's how you get down to the fund balance of 539,000 at the end of the year. You guys had a curtailment too, right? Yeah, we, we were uh, really deliberate in trying to save on the expenditure side because we knew we were gonna have some uh, 
offsets on the revenue side. We were also trying to build fund balance to get into FY20 with a little bit of extra um, to use for revenue. Um, I also have a note here, just we usually talk about the lunch program. That's, um, you know, definitely a, a program that's funded. We fund that with the general fund. It's not self-sustaining. Um, but there was an improvement in that, in the results there. Um, the loss in that program, uh, or I guess I'd say the subsidy in that program was about 185,000 this year, and par prior year it was 270. And uh, in years past, it was in that same range, 270 or more. So, um, showing an improvement there. Um, it's a pretty common situation where lunch programs, especially in the more affluent communities, really need a significant subsidy uh, to, to keep operating. So, there's only a handful of schools. Um, in the state that that actually make money on the lunch program and, and the one that I have that usually does MS 80 17 didn't make money this past year so so just just an area to always try to you know, stay on top of that's, that's what that's what the school department's been doing so um, I guess just summing up uh, you know everything I think is 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 really good uh, you've good finance departments at both the, the town and the school um, that's good to work with and uh, good results overall I think uh, for the audit any questions or comments none Good job, Ruth. Yeah. yeah. Kudos to staff. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, as well. Christian, thank you very much. Right. We yeah. appreciate your time. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.